Hello. Um, so this is the video for the uh, third section test here. Uh, by this point, you should know all of the boilerplate. Uh, you know what a section test is. You know it's out of 20 points. Um, you know it's due date, April 23rd at 11.55 p.m. It's five minutes to midnight. Um, uh, missed assignment policy. Uh, I, on the last one, I did have some issues with people sending me the wrong documents, so make sure you get me the right ones. Um, assignment submission. Uh, missed assignment policy. Uh, I'm very limited um, for this final assignment. How it works is you get me your assignments. I've got 48 hours to turn all of your grades over. Um, so on this final assignment, you won't receive comments. You'll only receive a grade. Uh, your grades will be popping up within that 48-hour period because April 23rd is when everything closes off. Um, so uh, the missed assignment policy, I do have a little bit of wiggle room, but not much. So get these things in on time. And um, plagiarism, uh, don't do it. Um, it. There are good ways to use uh, resources that are out there, and there are nefarious ways to use resources that are out there. Um, you, know, you can use things like Wikipedia and Sparknotes, provided you say this comes from Wikipedia or Sparknotes, and then you provide your own analysis. Right? So it, none of this is a substitute for actually knowing yourself. Uh, so reference those sources, or better yet, uh, it, I'm in this because I want to know what you have taken from this material. So um, it, that's where your grade comes from. So um, just tell me what you've taken from this material. Uh, so at this point, you know, uh, your readings are uh, Nietzsche's uh, Beyond Good and Evil's uh, preface in sections one and two. Uh, my questions relate to the preface in section one. So um, th that's what you're responsible for there. And uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's Existentialism and Human Emotions. If you're freaking out because you don't have this book, I've put a PDF of it up on uh, Moodle for your reference as well. And uh, all of uh, the video material. Uh, so I've laid this out, um, four questions, two on Nietzsche, two on Sartre, five points each, totaling 20. Um, uh, the first one on Nietzsche, uh, both Roderick and I sort of engaged this heavily, right? Uh, this has to do with um, Nietzsche's perspectivity or perspectivism. Um, it reads uh, Nietzsche at several points throughout the sections of BGE, which is Beyond Good and Evil, uh, that we've looked at refers to perspectivity, calling it, quote, the fundamental condition of all life. I'll give you the reference there. Uh, Roderick, in the video provided on Moodle, uh, defends this position, claiming that it's not a form of relativism. If, then, it's not a form of relativism, what is perspectivity? That's your question. Um, I'm asking this question because Roderick does a good job of demonstrating that it's not relativism, but he does not do the greatest job talking about what perspectivity is. Um, so. Especially even in that, uh, that, 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 that section that I quoted from in the question, uh, which is the preface, uh, right off the bat, um, Nietzsche is offering a critique of what he sees as the sort of dogmatism or imperialism of uh, Western philosophy or Western theory, insofar as it um, presents its view, um, its, 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 its definition of truth as the only definition of truth. So it enforces a single viewpoint as the only acceptable one. Uh, Roderick went into this, and this was your discussion forum question re regarding the nets of interpretation. Um, uh, what this works out to as is um, by Nietzsche's account, Western philosophy, Western theory, uh, enforce their perspective as the only valid perspective, and by enforcing it, really this is an assertion of power, right? And by exerting power this way, um, the, the perspective, the interpretation, then determines exactly what counts as truth, what counts as a fact, etc., etc., etc. Now, um, 
particularly with regard to um, this passage, um, it, he's critical of Plato and more or less Western philosophy for having done this um, and denying perspectivity. Perspectivity we might think of, uh, my standard example is uh, when looking at any object, right? You only look at it from the one angle, you don't see the whole thing. In order to see the whole thing, you've got to look at it from all of the various angles in order to uh, develop a well-rounded understanding. Right? Now, um, disciplines generally and um, theoretical positions right, that are taken and defended and uh, enforced right, um, deny perspectivity, deny that you can look at a phenomena from a number of different angles. Nietzsche is claiming that, that really if we're going to be on firm epistemological ground, that's, that's what we have to do. Now, um, how does this play out in terms of our ethics class? Right. Um, well, the title of the book is called Beyond Good and Evil, right? and um, we can pick on Kant here. Right? It's, you, you've just read through Kant's grounding to the metaphysic of morals, and you know for Kant, Kant only looks at one aspect of moral action, calling it the only way to determine the moral quality of a particular action, or more accurately, a, you know, um, an abstract proposition, right? a principle. Right? So the only thing that makes an action moral is if we act out of reverence for duty, and his notion of duty takes into account only the intentions behind the action and not the consequences of that action. Right? So, right, this is a single sort of unconditional sort of moral assertion. It's sort of a my way or the highway, right? Perspectivity, right, on the other hand, would uh, offer a way to critique this insofar as um, it, it, it involves being able to, as on 104, I quote this in the video too, um, your page 104, it's section 211, um, Nietzsche's new category of philosopher, um, perhaps he even needs to have been a critic, a skeptic, a dogmatist, a his, and, his, and a historian. Uh, in addition, a poet, a collector, a traveler, a puzzle solver, a moralist, a seer, and a free spirit in nearly all things so that, this is the operative phrase here, so that he can traverse the range of human values and value feelings and be able to look with many kinds of eyes and consciousness, uh, consciences from the heights into every distance, from the depths into every height, from the corners, da 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 You get the idea. Um, so when we are considering, by Nietzsche's estimation, the morality of, 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 of a proposition or of an action, um, what we need to be able to do is look at it from a variety of different angles rather than enforcing one notion of the good and its requisite evil. Right? So, so this, this has to do with being able to take up a number of different viewpoints or perspectives. Um, it, oddly, out of Nietzsche, um, a feminist epistemology has picked up on this as a means of critique, right? arguing that you know, in, in the context of institutions that, that, that have power, like universities or governments or bureaucracies or companies, right? and there might be something like a privileged viewpoint. So here I am, white, male, um, that sort of thing, and in my experience, the university has been fairly fair to me. Right? Um, I haven't felt disadvantaged on the basis of who I am, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that this might lead me to believe that, you know, really there's this egalitarian sort of meritocracy going on at the university. Right now, if I were a person of color, I might feel differently about that. If I were a woman of color, I might feel differently about that. If I were a disabled woman of color, I might feel even more differently about it, etc., etc., etc. So what Nietzsche is arguing here is that being able to take a number of different viewpoints, right, not just the one that you have, which presents you with an incomplete understanding of 
how power expresses itself in the context of an institution or the context of a methodology. Right? This is essential right, to understanding and being able to critique and formulate a moral position. Right? So um, it's not a form of relativism. Right? How, how does relativism fit into this? Well, it's not a form of relativism, as Roderick points out, because it is not taking up the posi position that any viewpoint or any belief or any um, interpretation is as good as any other interpretation. Right? So if, if that were the position that perspectivity were taking, right, then the conversation would be over because everything's like your opinion. Man, right? There's no opportunity to actually engage in a substantive dialogue. Perspectivity maintains the, the substance right, of the validity of the various viewpoints, but argues that they have different capacities to reveal right, the underlying nature of a given phenomenon, whether that be a moral phenomenon or a thing in the world or um, what have you. Right? So um, this first question asks you to um, engage uh, with that. Right. Second question uh, relates to section 19 of Beyond, Beyond Good and Evil, and you find section 19 between page 18 and 21 uh, with some good stuff, I believe, over on page 23 as well. So um, 18 to 21, uh, boo boo boo. Uh, where Nietzsche is talking about the will. Now, remember, um, uh, no, page 21. No, that's, it's just 18 to 21. Um, <clears throat> now, remember, way back at the beginning of this class, I said that this whole sort of ethics question, moral philosophy more generally, doesn't make any sense without an emphatic notion of freedom. What Nietzsche is saying in this section is that we have oversimplified our notion of freedom. And throughout the course, we've looked at a number of incredibly similar notions of freedom. We start with Socrates, where freedom has to do with using our rational capacity to uh, think about you know, the essential nature, the underlying nature of things, and engaging in this sort of critical, rational sort of activity. We're freest when we're doing that. We're unfree um, when we are, when we're acting on the basis of our desire. That's animalistic, right? Again, in Aristotle, we find that reason offers us a position outside of our emotions and our circumstances in order to evaluate our emotions and our circumstances in order that they direct themselves towards what's best. And again, in Kant, uh, we find that reason, independently of all experience, gives us the ability to evaluate principles. Right? So Kant's notion of autonomy is that reason can limit the will, right? factoring out inclination, desire, circumstances, personal considerations, etc., etc. This is what freedom is, right? according to these theorists. Well, Nietzsche wants to call a question to that because um, he, he doesn't buy the, the idea of um, a reason which is itself unconditioned, right? So uh, what he does is points out that the will is actually something complicated and breaks it down into four parts. Uh, the first two parts actually give the will some place to be because that's something that's missing in all of these theorists. Right? What's good about reason determining the will is in, in the initial theorists that we studied, that, that I just mentioned, Socrates, Aristotle, Kant, that sort of thing, is that, I mean, it, reason gives you a perspective other than one that's, that's wrapped up in your circumstances and uh, your bundles of interests and desires. Right? Well, Nietzsche talks about the act of willing in terms of this four-part breakdown, first pointing out that um, it's made up of feelings, or a better translation might be sensations, uh, the feeling of the condition we're moving away from, feeling, feeling of the condition we're moving towards, the feeling of this away and towards, and um, the concomitant feeling in our muscles uh, that without our actually moving arms or legs that come into play with, out of a kind of 
um, have it whenever we will. This is on page 18. So these sensations, right? So it gives us sort of a sensate awareness of uh, the situation in which we're making a choice. Right? Second, just as we must realize a feeling, and indeed many kinds of feeling, as an ingredient of the will, so we must likewise recognize thinking in every act of the will, there's a commanding thought, right? sort of a, a conceptual awareness right? that directs us towards our goal. Right? So um, yeah, I think of this in terms of a conceptual awareness of our circumstances. Right? So the first two actually put us somewhere right, in a way that the previous theorists did not. Now, the next two parts have to do with um, what nature calls emotions, right, and they're, uh, they establish sort of a tension right within uh, the will itself. There's, it's not merely a complex of feelings and thoughts, it's above all an emotion, and in fact the emotion of command, what, what's called freedom of the will, is essentially the emotion of superiority felt towards one who must obey. I'm free, he must obey. This consciousness lies in every will, as does a tense alertness, a direct gaze concentrated on one thing alone, and an unconditional um, assessment that now we must have this and nothing else, an inner certainty that obedience will follow, and everything else that goes along with the condition of giving commands. A person who will, wills is a person commanding a something in himself that obeys or he thinks is obeying. Right. So, um, what we tend to call freedom of the will is generally this sort of emotion of superiority we feel as the commander and the successful instrument, uh, uh, executing instrument of the command. Right. Now, this is the weird thing about Nietzsche's um, treatment of the will. If there is a commanding that's going on. We command ourselves to do X. There's something in us that also obeys. Right? He points out, but let's consider the strangest thing about the will, about this multifarious thing that common people call by one word alone. In any given case, we both command and obey, and when we obey, we feel feelings of coercion, pressure, oppression, resistance, agitation that begin immediately after the act of the will. On the other hand, we are in the habit of ignoring or overlooking this division by means of this synthetic concept of I, right? We, we consider ourselves the ones, we, we think of ourselves as a pilot in a machine, right? That's executing all of these commands, right? But that's not quite accurate. If we consult our experience, we find that in every act of the will, there's sort of a push and pull, right? I feel this every time I try to get out of get myself out of bed to start my day. I'm just like, oh, do I have to get out of bed? Yep, yep, yep. I gotta get out of bed. Come on, come on. Let's get going. Right? There's that sort of inner push and pull. Right? There's an internal resistance. Right? And um, another example might be when I sit down to grade. And by the way, I'm grading your stuff. It should be coming up very soon. Um, every time I sit down to grade, right, it's, it's, there's there's a, a will to grade because, you know, you got to get this stuff done, I owe it to you guys, etc., etc., etc. But on the other hand, I get this case of what my wife and I call the I don't want us, <laughs> right? That sort of resists my, 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 my actions. Right, at every so what Nietzsche is arguing here is a couple of things. First off, that we've mischaracterized freedom of the will right, altogether, right? Because we identified something as something simple, right? When in fact it's something complicated. What's more, secondly, we've mischaracterized freedom of the will because think about it. If freedom of the will, as he defines it on the bottom of 19, that is the word for the complex, pleasurable condition experienced by the person willing who commands and simultaneously identifies himself with the one who executes the command, as such he can share in, in, uh, share in um, enjoying the triumph over resistance while secret, well, secretly judging that it was actually his will that overcame that resistance. Well, there's, there's a problem with that. 
right? If freedom of the will is the pleasure that we experience having executed an action, then freedom of the will only appears after the action, right? So freedom of the will is not that which brings about the action, it's the pleasure that we get from having executed the action, right? And then finally, right, speaking about free wills or likewise unfree wills, right, Nietzsche says is nonsensical because it's conditioned and it's always situated, right? So when we will, we're not really free, but not, we're not really unfree either, right? So he suggests over on 21 at the bottom, right? Um, but boo, 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 uh, we alone are the ones who have invented causes, succession, reciprocity, um, uh, relativity, coercion, number, law, freedom, um, reason, purpose, and if we project, and if we project, if we mix this wor world of science into things as if it were an in itself, we act once more as we've always done, that is mythologically. The unfree will is mythology. In real life, it's only a matter of strong or weak wills, right? So rather than an exercise of some sort of unconditioned freedom when we choose, when we exert the will, right? Really, it's a feat of strength, right? So that's where Nietzsche is going there. Um, so really all I need for that question is the four part breakdown, right? And some sort of commentary overview. Right. So hopefully that should be um, that should be straightforward. Now the last two questions are so close to one another, I would have no problem if you combined them right, and answered them as though they are one question. Right. The first part uh, deals with um, one of the basic principles of existentialism which uh, expresses itself um, two, two ways, right? Existence precedes essence, or if you prefer, subjectivity must be the starting point. Um, and it's a quotation from Sartre on uh, page 13 of your existentialism in human emotions. Um, so uh, I ask this question because basically, if you understand what Sartre means by existence precedes essence, you understand existentialism, or at least his existentialism. All right, so what, what's meant by existence preceding essence? Well, let's invert it, right? What does it mean to say essence precedes existence? Somewhere uh, there is a schematic, a blueprint for this stupid thing, right? The idea, right, for this stupid thing. And on the basis of that blueprint for this stupid thing, this coffee cup, uh, they've got some sort of extruder machine that just stamps out millions of the bloody things. Right, so for the coffee cup, essence or idea precedes existence. First we think it up, and then they stamp out a bunch of them. Right, so right, that's the way it works for stupid things like that. Not so for humans, argues Sartre. Right, we're not so easily defined. Right, and in fact, this is because we're constantly in the process of defining ourselves through our choices and through our actions. The example that I've been using um, super lately um, is, uh, did you guys hear about that Chinese scientist who um, uh, used uh, gene editing technology called CRISPR um, to uh, edit um, the genes of uh, some babies so that they would become AIDS resistant? Right. Well, he chose, he exercised his freedom in order to do this, and in choosing, right, he defined the whole of humanity. Human beings didn't used to include this capacity to edit ourselves genetically. Now we do. Right. So, with each and every one of our choices and each and every one of our ch actions, if existence precedes essence, we first exist and through our choices and our actions, we then define ourselves. Right? So where a coffee cup right, starts off with an essence and then from that essence we bring it into existence, for human beings on the other hand it works the other way. Right? Because we're free 
and we're effectively nothing until we choose and we act. Only then do we become something. Right? So that's what's meant by existence precedes essence. Now why subjectivity is the starting point. I mean, we live in an era, well, before this claim, we, we, we have traditionally been thought to live in an era right, that prefers objectivity and objective sciences and that sort of thing. It's generally a slander if you say, well, that's just subjective, right? Well, what does it mean? Why would Sartre argue that subjectivity has to be the starting point? Right? Well, think about it. If existence precedes essence and everything comes down to our choices and our actions that produce an essence or a definition of what it means to be human, right? it's subjects and they're choosing and they're actually acting in the world that bring about this definition this meaning to the term human being, right? So, right, rather than objectivity, right, when it comes to humans, if we are going to understand human beings, we can't understand them the way that we do a coffee cup in terms of an objective definition of this particular thing, right? Because we're different. Subjectivity has to be the starting point, right? Now, um, it, in order not to turn subjects, that is, human beings, free beings like ourselves, into objects, things, right? So, it's in order to afford us some dignity, right? Now, um, that's what I'm asking you to engage with in question three, and like I say, it is so close to question four, I would, if I were answering this, I'd combine them, right? Now, to follow up, start on page 18 of Existentialism in Human Emotions, in order to make clear the relatedness of freedom and responsibility, it inserts, in choosing myself, I choose man or mankind. Right? What does Sart mean by this claim, and what does this claim have to do with anguish or anxiety? Right? Now, in choosing ourselves, we choose all of mankind. This follows directly from existence precedes essence. Right? So if we are really engaged in this sort of definitional activity and defining humanity, what humanity means depends on our exercises of our freedom. I'm doing it. You're doing it. Everybody out there is doing it. That Chinese scientist is doing it. The people that work at the, 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 the customer service stations at Walmart or uh, Delta Airlines are doing it. The person you pass on the street is doing it. Each and every one of us, through our choices and our actions, are defining human in a way that obligates all of us. Right? So we ought to feel anxious, right? Because if we're absolutely free and everything depends on our freedom, then Everything is our responsibility. Everything. Not just our choices and our actions, the choices and actions of every human being out there are our responsibility because we have to define ourselves in relation to all of it and other people's choices and actions actually have bearing on our definition of ourselves. Right? So if I want to say, oh, yo, no, I'm I'm not capable of participating in a genocide. Well, guess what? You're human, and human beings are capable of participating in genocides. Right? That's something. That's something. Recent history has shown us that you know we're 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 almost constantly doing. There are genocides going on right now. Right. So um, you know, no, I'm not capable of racism. Yes, yes, we all we all are. Guess what? It's it's. That's human, right? And we're human, right? This is what it means to be us, right? We like to say that things don't affect us, like we're somehow exempt from the 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 the, 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 the goings on in the world, right? But that's not the case, because what it means to be us, right, is an expression of our freedom, and that's never a private thing, 
right? because we're constantly defining what it means to be human. Right? So we're nothing but our freedom and our actions. Only when we exercise this freedom do we become something. And this should be enough to floor us with anxiety. Right? So anguish or anxiety is not something to be overcome, it's something to be encountered as an essential feature of what it means to be human, an essential part of our condition. I slipped there, I called it an essential feature, it's not an essence. Right? It's part of our condition. Right? We find ourselves as human beings in a situation where we have to choose and act, and those choices and acts, actions define all of humanity we got to be anxious. Now it seems like a lot of people aren't anxious. Why aren't they, they anxious? Because they lie to themselves. I had no choice. It's not my fault. It's company policy, sir. It's out of my hands. Bull. Bull. That is bull. Because Company policies only become company policies when members of that organization enforce those company policies because we're the ex executing instruments. Right? We're always free. Right? If it's company policy and I have no choice, that's untrue. I could quit my job and protest because the company policy is something that's unjust. Right? So I choose to be the executing instrument of that company policy. Right? So I am responsible in ways that are uncomfortable and produce anxiety. Right? So you should be anxious. So that is your test. Um, um, advice, um, use your time. You've got a long time to engage with these questions. If you did one a day, you'd have a bunch of days left over um, to review them and to enhance them and that sort of thing. Um, proofread. Oh, proofread. Because we're trying to use language to describe something very precisely and language isn't always very precise. So if you're using a term, define it correctly. Make sure you're using the right term. If you're making a distinction, make the distinction and make that distinction clearly, right? Make sure that your written work expresses what you mean. Have somebody else read it for you and see if it makes any sense, right? Don't tell them anything about it, say just read this. Right? See if they can make head or, head, heads nor tails of what you've written. Because if somebody can't, then you've not communicated the ideas kind of clear. Right? Uh, so um, those, those are two bits of advice. Um, and reference absolutely anything that you use uh, other than your own reflections. Right? There's no shame in it. Right? There's absolutely no shame in using sources. I mean, I've got a long bibliography to my dissertation and over a thousand references. Over a thousand of them. There's a good bit of my analysis in there, but right, I'm using other people's reflections to enhance my own understanding. So I'm saying, look, I got it from here, but this part's fine. Right? It's fine and dandy. And keep in mind what I'm looking for is your analysis. Right? Because in a university education, we're trying to um, become right, the researchers, become the analysts. Right? So that's your job. Right? Anyhow, um, it's been an interesting semester. Um, I've read some interesting work. Uh, you've, you've, many of you have had some really in, uh, valuable insights uh, into this material. Um, hopefully this last section isn't too different. I, I know it is. Um, a few housekeeping items. Uh, your form grades, uh, your forms will close on April 23rd at 11.55 as well. Uh, your form grades will pop up shortly after that. Um, in the little section that has a section in gradebook called Form Grades. 
So um, uh, make sure you've posted at very least once for each of the forums. If you miss them, you lose points. Um, more is better. Right? I want evidence that you're attempting to have a substantive conversation about the material. Right? That's, that's, that's what I ask myself. Right? Did they try to have a conversation about the material with some sort of substance rather than, this is stupid, I don't like this. Right? So um, that's forums. Um, you've got uh, one final quiz that's also due April 23rd at 11.55 p.m. The other thing that I've decided to do for you is open up a bonus attempt um, for uh, a, a, your, your lowest grade quiz, of course, excluding the one that's due April 23rd. Um, so a few things about that. Uh, first off, if you missed a quiz, um, that'll be your bonus attempt quiz. If you've missed more than one um, uh, quiz, then uh, I will pick the first one that you've missed, no substitutions. Right. I'll just pick for you and that's, that's the opportunity you get. Um, I, I realize that there's another category of anomaly, ano ooh, anomaly with this uh, yesterday while talking to my on-campus class. Uh, if you've gotten perfect on all of them, you don't get a bonus attempt because you wouldn't benefit from it. I suppose you could try to get another five, but yeah, <laughs> there's no point. So um, if I, I, I pass you over, right, that's because you rock them and don't need a bonus anyway. Um, so uh, that's the deal with that. Um, your section test two, uh, it's, I'm grading them, the grades are popping up for you. Uh, I'm trying to work as quickly as possible uh, through those assignments. You'll have feedback um, before your due date, of course, and um, well before your due date. Um, I'm trying to get it done uh, before our classes technically end. Um, I see uh, next Wednesday the 17th is a study day. So um, uh, buyer before then, I'm trying to get all of your, um, your grades up to this point back to you. Um, so that'll be the case. So um, I guess that's it. Uh, I look forward to reading your responses. Uh, I will be checking my email. So if you need anything, let me know. All right, uh, thank you for the semester. Uh, have wonderful days, one for each of you.